the daughter of um, Abdul Hadi al Khawaja, who is the hunger striking man uh, who is in the prison of uh, Bahrain right now. And the second one is uh, Fatima Ali, doctor in Bahrain, um, who will also tell her story how she has suffered in Bahrain. I am Duba Shah, the event coordinator from the NGO called Crossing Borders. Um, this is an NGO which has an aim to uh, connect people around the world um, across cultures and create this dialogue, a strong dialogue, which will deliver the message of peace uh, and the human rights. Uh, so please put your hands together for Mariam and Dr. Fatima. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, thank you all for being here today. Uh, we're happy to be here to share our experiences and stories with you. And thank you to Crossing Borders for organizing the event. Um, I am the acting president of the Bahrain Center for Human Rights, as well as co-director of the Gulf Center for Human Rights. And we, generally speaking, what we do is we cover all types of human rights violations that happen in Bahrain, which is the country of my origin. I'm also a Danish citizen. Um, of course, you've all heard about the mass democracy protests that happened across the Middle East and North Africa region. And Bahrain was no exception. People decided that it was a time for them to come out and make demands and talk about the things that they wanted to see in their country. You know, growing up in Denmark uh, for 12 years that we were here, we learned, or we didn't learn, we took for granted a lot of the rights that we had. You know, the, the fact that you can step out as a student and say anything you want because it's your opinion and it's protected by law. The fact that you can study what you want, that you can, you know, have different opinions, that you can get into discussions, and that if anyone does anything to overstep or overwrite your rights, your rights, then you have a way, a system, to get justice for what's happening. When I was 14 years old, we moved to Bahrain, and all of those rights were taken away overnight. During the uprising in Bahrain, what we saw is basically, I mean, how many of you have Facebooks? Facebook? Yeah? How many of you have Twitter? Not so much? Okay. Imagine we have students in Bahrain. Imagine LG. Imagine you log on to Facebook one day, you see a picture you like, you click like on the button, right? You guys do that pretty much every day, right? Now imagine because you click like on a picture on Facebook, the next night your house gets raided by masked men with guns who pick you up take you somewhere while you're blindfolded, your family don't know where you are, you get beaten, you might get tortured, you might get sexually assaulted, and then you're taken to court because you liked a picture on Facebook. This has happened in Bahrain. People lost their jobs because they liked pictures on Facebook. People were beaten, people were arrested, people were tortured because they liked pictures on Facebook or because they wrote a tweet on Twitter. And this has become the new reality of Bahrain. You know, the 10 years were when we lived in Bahrain, we saw injustice. There weren't, you know, regular freedoms and democracy or liberties or anything like that. You don't have a right to have an opinion. Because you as a human being, the only way that you matter is how you can serve the ruling family in the country. It's a business. And you work for them. And so you serve their interests. So you only matter as far as you can serve their interests. And if you don't serve their interests, they find a way of getting rid of you. That's how it works. And it was very strange to move from this country to that one because we went from, like I said, from taking these things for granted to suddenly realizing what it felt like to live without these basic freedoms. Where if you went out and you said an opinion, you could get arrested or you could disappear or you could get tortured or otherwise. Um, 2011, it wasn't that these revolutions caused each other. So people in Bahrain were not sitting at home one day and said, well, because people went out in Egypt and Tunisia, we're going to go out in Bahrain as well. No, they saw what happened. They knew that they had the same situation in their country. People already didn't like the situation. We had 500 political prisoners in a country of 600,000 people. People were subjected to systematic 
physical, psychological, and sexual torture in the country. 23% of all political prisoners were children under the age of 18. And this was something that was happening again and again. You could go out, leave your house, and get kidnapped from three hours up to three days, where you are then found somewhere in the streets, half naked, tied up. And this kept happening. So it wasn't that they caused each other, but they inspired each other. Basically, people reached a point where they felt, you know what? We can't make sense. They weren't hopeless anymore. They said, well, maybe if we take to the streets, we can actually create a different situation for ourselves. Maybe we can regain some of that dignity and some of that freedom that we have lived without for such a long time. And we saw this when people were gathered in, you know, Tahrir Square in Egypt. We saw this in the Freedom, uh, the Freedom Square in Tunisia. And we saw this when people came out in the Pearl Square in Bahrain. You know, it was like it was like you're living underwater for such a long time without oxygen, and then suddenly you come above water and you can breathe again. This is what it felt like for people to be out there, and you know. Whatever comes to your head, whatever opinion you have, you write it on a banner and you hold it up. And for the first time in your life, you can do that. Because you were no longer, or you felt like it wasn't necessary for you to be afraid any longer. So this is something that changed a bit, you know? Then the bad part happened. Bahrain isn't Egypt. And Bahrain isn't Libya. Why? Because Bahrain is a friend to the United States of America. And Bahrain is a friend to the United Kingdom and most of the EU, and all these other countries that, you know, love democracy and human rights. And where we saw a foreign military intervention in Libya to help the freedom fighters against Gaddafi, we saw a foreign intervention in a military form, in Bahrain as well, but it wasn't for the people. It was to support the dictatorship in Bahrain against the people who were demanding freedom and democracy. And they came from Saudi Arabia, and they came from the United Arab Emirates. And what they did is they helped the regime stay in power. And they tried to end the revolution in Bahrain. Now, they haven't been able to. For two years now, since the beginning of the uprising in Bahrain, every single day there are protests. You just don't hear about it. You don't hear about it in the media. You don't hear about it internationally. The governments aren't talking about it. Even the very simplest steps of accountability, of holding the government accountable for crimes and violations, have not happened for Bahrain. Now imagine you have uh, Russia coming out and saying, well, we have a right to continue supplying Syria with arms despite everything that's happening, because they're an ally, and because we have a base and we have security interests there. The United States and the United Kingdom are using the same excuse as Russia to continue supporting the Bahraini regime. The difference is, we all know what Russia is. And we thought that the United States and the United Kingdom were supposed to be different because they're supposed to uphold democracy and human rights and so on. So when you find these countries that are supposed to support democracy and freedom using the same excuses as Russia and other countries to continue supporting regimes that are committing widespread human rights violations. And when I say widespread, it's across the country. Tens of thousands of people have been in and out of prison, tortured, sacked from their jobs, and you know, basically live in terror on a daily basis. You never know when your house, when your house might be broken into at 2 a.m. in the morning. You never know when a tear gas when a tear gas might be shot inside your home. And this is the con continuous situation uh, of what we're seeing today in Bahrain. Now for us, it's the Bahrain Center for Human Rights, and we have an office here in Copenhagen actually. What we do is we try to bring back the voice of the people inside Bahrain. You know, they've been completely silenced, which is why you don't hear about it in the media, right? In Denmark actually, you hear about it more than other places because of the connection between, of the Danish citizens uh, imprisoned in Bahrain. But imagine that Abdul Hadi Khawaja had not gone on a hunger strike. How many of you would know about him? How many of you actually even know that there's a Swedish citizen in Bahrain? who was in prison, and who was severely tortured, and sentenced up to 96 years. And he's a political prisoner, he didn't commit any crimes. But how many of you hear about the American citizen who gets caught and imprisoned in Iran? Everybody hears about it. So why is it when we have three EU citizens imprisoned, tortured, and put in prison in Bahrain, nobody hears about it? And I think, you know, this is one of the things that for me is very important. 
We need, as, you, as EU citizens, to start questioning these things, to start questioning the double standards of the governments that are supposed to represent us. When we say we fight for human rights, we need to fight for human rights everywhere, regardless of whether we think it's good for us to have an economic relationship with them or not, because human rights matter. We need to reach a point, you know, in our systems where a barrel of oil coming from Saudi Arabia is not more valuable than human lives in Bahrain. That's something that we need to, to come beyond. So, to very quickly introduce Dr. Farah Fatma, um, the BCHR actually just released a report about access to health in the medical system in Bahrain. Um, she'll be talking a little bit more about that and her own experiences. Dr. Fatma is an internal medicine specialist and a rheumatologist who was arrested and tortured in 2011 uh, because she treated injured protesters. Uh, we continue to have medics who are continuously under attack inside Bahrain, whether it's through putting them in prison or, you know, not, not allowing them to work. So Dr. Papa is one of the medics who's not allowed to work in Bahrain anymore, despite being acquitted by court. She was sentenced to five years imprisonment in a military court, and then she was acquitted in a civil court. Uh, but despite that, you know, the, the persecution of medics has not stopped. And then further to that, they're now using the health facilities and the hospitals, uh, which Dr. Papa also will talk about, as a tool to actually go after people. So imagine that you go out in a protest and you get shot and you're bleeding and you can't go to the hospital. That's the situation in Bahrain today. But I'll leave that to the Dr. Fatma to speak about. So I'll hand it over. One, once a time I've been, um, I've been a student. Um, I was studying medicine and I thought, you know, life goes all around myself. I mean, like myself studying, graduating, and I'll be like a doctor. And then I'll go and work in the hospital, and then I have my own car, my own house. And you know, that's like sort of dreams that everybody has of this life. And I was not caring about what's happening in the country. I mean, it's not that not caring, but you don't pay attention of that sort of stuff. Um, have anyone saw the movie Matrix? Yeah. So, I used to love the Matrix. And then, um, on February 17th, Somebody came and he given me, you know, he gave me the choice to choose between the green pill and the red pill. And for me, I think, you know, I don't regret, but I guess I chose the, the wrong pill. So, which was that, the red or green? Ah, uh, okay. So, yeah, I took the pill that made me, um, you know, made, made my eyes open on what's happening in reality. Um, I used to work in the hospital and then all of a sudden I received a phone call 4 a.m. in the morning from my superior saying that um, disaster call had been activated in the hospital, we need lots of doctors, please try to get your friends and come. And then um, I woke up my husband, uh, we drove the car, we tried to go and what's happening? I know that there were protesters, you know, trying, they were peaceful youths were gathering at the purple of the bus and they, they were asking for reforms and democracy and then they have certain, certain slogans, but then um, with the news that they'd been attacked, okay fine, I knew the government, like this is not the, this is not the unusual, like the government that keeps on attacking the youths, like every 10 years there is an attack. So what's the new thing about it this time? Um, on my way to the to the hospital, I I had to go by the the parallel depot because that's that's the way it is. So um, it's like what's happening? It's like a war, you know. Real uh, right, security forces all over, military tanks all over. Um, they were shooting like like insane, you know, up and down and left and right. And they didn't. Does it matter for them you are protesting or not? Are you female or male? Or you're a kid or you're geriatric? The shooting was continuous. So I made it, I took some time and I made it through to the hospital and I went there, it was a completely chaos. People are coming, hundreds and hundreds of youth, crying, screaming, pain, horror, smell of blood, smell of fear, you know, uh, there's, there's children crying, they're, they're, they're lost. They don't know where their fathers or their, their mothers are. Women, they're looking for their husbands. Uh, men, they, they, they have been, they've been you know, shot by the security forces, by their own government, just because they said we want democracy. 
um, I felt it was a prejudice, but then, well, I'm a doctor, I'm a professional. I'm not supposed to feel, I'm supposed to be, you know, um, supposed to do whatever you need to do. Like, I started to take care of this, provided whatever medical care we can. And then the next minute, uh, a friend of mine, uh, he's a colleague, He's a doctor too. He was uh, spending the night in the Perron Depot because there was a medical tent that they were providing uh, first aid. And then they brought him by ambulance, beaten up badly, uh, to the level that his, I didn't recognize him. His face was swollen, fractured all over, fractured ribs, and he did not breathe. He, he ended up in the uh, intensive care unit. Um, and that's because he was spending the night there and he was wearing the red crescent jacket so they didn't even differentiate if you're a doctor helping or just a protester then in another minute the paramedics came back to the hospital they, the, the, the security forces stole the ambulance and then they evacuated the ambulances of the wounded people they hit the paramedics and then they sent them and then there was a complete ban on all the ambulances of getting to the permanent depot and try to help the people so it's either you are killed immediately, or you will leave, you will be left in the street. Um, I mean, from bleeding from your wounds or die. You will not receive medical care. And that was outrageous. You know, you can't like kill people like that, and nobody is talking and nobody is stopping you. Uh, so that that was the moment. Um, I mean, the medics have intervened, and we 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 ask for you know. Um, we ask that we need to help these people. They are, at the end of the day, uh, if they protest or not, they are just people and they are wounded and they need to, to be treated. Um, the, the turning point in my life was the minute that they brought a 60 years old male. He was trying to help these protesters, uh, the young, to get into the hospital because they were, they were shooting nearby the hospital. So what happened is that he's 60 years old. He was having difficulty in walking. So he tripled and fell down on the floor. And one of the security guards came and he put the gun on his head and poof, he blew it. So he came almost without a head. And that made me go hysteric. I could not tell her. So I kept crying. And like, I'm not crying, I mean hysterically crying. And for that I came, uh, it was like an incident that Al Jazeera was documenting all what's happening from violations. So uh, it came on a documentary called Chatness in Dark. I would advise all of you to have a look at it. It's like an hour documentary. You would know what happened and, and it will give you a, you know, a summary of what happened in Bahrain back in 2011. For that, uh, I've been taken, uh, kidnapped from my home. I left my two and a half year old son alone. Uh, without anybody to take care of. Uh, 35, 40 m men with uh, machine guns raided my house. They took me, they tortured me for four continuous days. Um, beating, you know, beating um, sexual harassment, uh, electrocution. And that, just to confess that, they wanted to have a scenario, a scene telling the people or the media or the international uh, government that whatever you've seen in Bahrain is just fabrication. Nobody was uh, killed by, by the security forces. No, no, there was no wounded protesters. The blood on the street was actually, uh, uh, you know, it was stolen from the, the hospital and given to them. And uh, so my role in this scene was that I was the person who stole the blood and gave it to the protesters. So that was my crime. Uh, for that, I was sentenced five years. Uh, other colleagues have been accused of killing protesters because they were trying actually to help them, doing surgery to save their lives. But then, unfortunately, because they were shot by live bullets, they were dead. And then the, the horror continued. Um, been finishing from the military court, then um, I've been acquitted, never been back to hospital, uh, not allowed to work in Bahrain. So I've decided to do something to help the people. Then I started to, you know, um, to make it, uh, to document cases of torture and try to rehabilitate them. So um, the hospital has been completely militarized. Uh, youth who are going out, risking their life, 
asking for democracy, they will be either killed in the streets, um, if he is not dead, he will have certain injuries, he will be taken to the hospital. Inside the hospital, there will be security checkpoints. If they found about his injury, he will be arrested. And if he's lucky enough and he made it through to the hospital, there are surveillance cameras all over the hospital, more than 200 cameras, connected to the Ministry of Interior. So he will be either immediately arrested, or if he made it through, in the middle of his management or treatment, he will be arrested and taken to jail. And if he goes back to jail, they will, uh, miss, they will beat him on the site of the injury, and then they will deny him from receiving medical care. So if he needs a surgery, if he has a bullet in his eye, he will be beaten on the head and the eye, and he will be denied from having his surgery. And I'm talking about kids, like minors, children. There is a four-year-old boy, he was sitting with his father, who is a fisherman, and he was selling fish in the street. And then due to the, the massive shooting in the street, that they didn't differentiate between anyone. This four years old had received a bullet in his eye, and he lost that eye. They were accusing us of inciting heterodox against the government, but actually they provoke people to hate them. Who will love a government that will deny people or wounded people from receiving medical care? Who will love a, a government continuously every single night daily for the last two years until last night, shooting tear gases in the villages where people are gathered. Could you imagine you are, okay, I would say, okay, you know what? I don't care, let the government be corrupted, that everything happens, let them torture those two out in the street because, yeah, they deserve it. They wanted to do the street, they wanted to protest, then they have to they take the rest. But I'm sitting there now in my home with my two kids, um, who uh, we were just watching like any you know cartoon, and then all of a sudden, security forces decide to shoot inside the house. They are shooting tear gas inside the windows, and then the kids get suffocated. And then if you go into the hospital and you and you say that the tear the security forces are shooting inside my house, you will be arrested because you are complaining. And then they will arrest you for spreading false news or you're making false accusations. Could you stop, you know, uh, could you just continue caring about this government? Wouldn't you just go out on the street, like, even if you're not radical, even if you, you don't care about what's happening in the, in the, I mean, with the corruption of the government, don't, don't you want to protect your kids? Could you stay, uh, I mean, <clears throat> could you continue not doing anything I mean, people who are writing in a tweet, just for writing a, a tweet that saying or, or writing a comment on the Facebook, uh, last night there was a protest in my village. The next day they will come and arrest you. You're spreading news. So this is the amount of freedom of expression, freedom of gathering, freedom of anything. Freedom. Right to health has been violated. We've been taken, you know, um, your dignity has been broken. It's, it's really hard not to, you know, hate this type of government. So that's why um, the movement is continuous. Most of you didn't know that, like, whenever I said, like, last night there was a huge protest in the street, like, is there any problem in Bahrain? It's like, we are having this every single day and night. But the thing is that what kills us is not that the government is killing us. The silence. You know, I talk to people I know in the near, nearby countries like Kuwait, Dubai, um, those who are like, you know, less than an hour difference between us and them. They don't know nothing about what's happening. I think the responsibility of us is that we can't blame others that you don't give us the information. We are living in, in a world, in an era that internet is there. You can get information about, you know, uh, people living in March. You can get information about people living in Cambodia. So it is our responsibility to look and search for the truth. And thank you for that.
I've been meeting with the foreign ministry in Denmark for quite some time now, uh, pretty much since the beginning of the uprising in Bahrain. And to be very honest, it, it took effort and it took time for the Danish government to start moving on the case of Bahrain and specifically the Danish citizens. And it was very helpful that we were able to raise awareness inside Copenhagen and specifically within the framework of the media. Um, always when you want to pressure governments uh, in the EU or the US, the best way to do it is through media. Um, but the Danish government did do a lot when it comes to the case of their citizen. Um, I'm a human rights defender, so I'm, I'm a bit of an overachiever and I expect a little too much. Um, you know, as human rights defenders, we don't think of things as being from a perspective of realism or a perspective of what's realistic and what we should and shouldn't expect according to geopolitical and security and economic interests. We think that this is the way it should be and that's what we want to see. Um, so of course I always think that there's so much more that can be done. Um, but I think when it comes specifically to the case, I think there's a lot more they can do when it comes to Bahrain in general, especially within the framework of the EU. But I think for the case of my father specifically, they did do a lot. Uh, there was a huge campaign to try and get him released from prison and brought to Denmark, which never happened. Um, he's still in prison today, and so is my sister. Um, but that's a lot of that has to do with the fact that Denmark doesn't really have the pressure necessary to convince Bahrain to do anything they want. And to a large part, it's because they don't have the support they need from places like the United States and the United Kingdom, who are closer allies to Bahrain and have more of an influence. Um, but, you know, to compare it, and usually what I, you know, as, again, as human rights defenders, we don't usually compare what's happening to something worse and say, well, at least we're here. No, we usually compare it to what it's supposed to be and be like, we're not there yet. But to compare the different responses, like I was saying, the Swedish citizen in Bahrain, the Swedish government has done almost nothing for him. I don't even know if he gets consular visits. And we've been in touch with the Swedish government. We sent them information about how he was tortured. He wasn't only tortured in 2011, after the uprising started. He's been tortured since 2010, when the first crackdown started. Um, and he's been subjected to all forms of and shapes of torture, psychological, physical, and sexual. And the Swedish government did almost absolutely nothing for him. You know, so comparing what Denmark did for my father and what the Swedish government was willing to do for their citizen, you know, there's a huge difference. Um, that being said, of course, like I said, there's always space for more to be done. And, you know, that's why we continue to talk to them. Unfortunately, the way that politics work is that way. Is that, you know, there's only so much, there's only so much that people are willing to do when they're in power. Because at the end of the day, yes, security interests, geopolitical interests do matter to them. And unfortunately, like I said earlier, we haven't quite reached a point in this world where we do value human lives and human rights more than we value money and oil. We haven't gotten there yet. Even when we look at the United Nations system, which was supposedly set up to create a system that holds people accountable, where you can go to receive justice, where you can go to talk about human rights violations, even there, you are only as valuable as the passport you carry. And you're only as valuable as much noise as you can make. And if you carry a Bahraini passport today at the United Nations, you don't have much value. And so unfortunately, we're still at a point where uh, you know, we still need to develop these international systems. And this is something that, you know, for you guys as youth uh, and, and everyone else, you know, that's something that you can work on. You, you want to build a world where, you know, in several years, if th something happened in Denmark for the system to change, you have a way of objecting to it. Because what I've noticed is I lived in Bahrain for 10 years and I came back a year ago to Denmark. But what I've noticed when I travel around the EU and the US is that there are things changing here that I don't think are positive at all. You know, when you see in the United States Obama signing on to a, the NDAA, which gives him the right to put people in prison indefinitely if they suspect that they're involved in terrorism, suddenly your constitutional rights don't even matter anymore. When you have different governments around the EU using terrorism and using uh, fighting terrorism and security as a reason to go into your emails, to go into your personal life, to hack into your phones, suddenly you don't have the right to privacy anymore. 
And this is happening right here under our noses. Now, I don't know if uh, so much if Denmark is doing it or not, but I've seen it in the EU. We're not aware of it. You know, we continuously look towards the Middle East and North Africa region and say, oh, you know, you have those poor populations, we really need to do something maybe to help them. There's changes happening here that we're not aware of, that we need to be aware of. So one of the things that we're working on, and it's good to always raise awareness about these things, are you know laws and regulations within the EU about internet freedom, for example, about how you can hold uh, people accountable for breaches of privacy and your own personal rights, because we're all at risk. It's not just in the Middle East and North Africa region, and that's why when people ask me, oh, you know, you guys in the Middle East and North Africa and Bahrain, you're fighting because you want democracies like ours, right? I say no. With the price we're paying, we want something better. We don't want a system where a president has the right to put someone in prison for as long as he wants without a trial. No, we want a place where people have rights. Where the government is afraid of the people, not the people are afraid of the government. Because that's how it should be. So this is, you know, it's, it's, we're in a very difficult position right now, but there are a lot of good people out there who are working on trying to create a better system. And, you know, that's something that we can all work on. It's not something, you don't have to be a human rights defender or a human rights activist to do these things. By just raising awareness, by knowing when to say no to these things. Because, you know, you say yes to something very simple today. Tomorrow it won't be that simple anymore. Once you start putting constraints on things like freedom of speech and freedom of, uh, or the right to privacy and things like this, today it might be something small, but tomorrow it grows. And so we need to pay attention to these things as well. I kind of went really off topic there, but anyway. <laughs> So, the Bahraini people, the Bahraini population, they have the largest protests in what is known as the Arab Spring. More than 50% of the population were out on the streets. This didn't happen in any other country. Even in Egypt, where you had 1 million people in Tahrir Square, that was 1% of the entire population. In Bahrain, it was more than 50. Um, and the civil rights movement in Bahrain goes all the way back to the 1920s. Uh, so something that's very, very old, very, very well enshrined. Now, when the Bahrainis took to the streets in 2011, no one, even now, no one is demanding military help. No one wants NATO to come in and say, you know what, we're going to come and free from your government. Nobody's asking for that at all. What people in Bahrain need from the international community, from Western governments that say that they uphold and respect human rights and democracy, is for them to actually do that. It's for the double standards towards human rights violations in different countries for that to stop. Because once the Bahraini government starts facing real accountability, real consequences for committing massive human rights abuses, that's when the people of Bahrain can create change. So basically all they need is the very basic that other countries are getting already. They just need the Bahraini government to be held accountable internationally for the human rights violations to stop, then they're more than capable of bringing about change. They don't need help with that. You know, people in Bahrain from the very beginning made it very clear that they don't want any type of foreign intervention from any of the neighbors or non-neighbors around them because they're capable of bringing change. It's about stopping human rights violations because there's two types of human rights violators. There are the violators themselves who actually go out on the streets and shoot people and kill them or you know torture them or put them in prison. Then there's the enablers of human rights violations. Companies in Europe that are selling software technology to Syria and Bahrain and other places that actually allows these governments to track activists and then arrest them and torture them, they are just as much violators as those gov governments committing those violations. And when those companies are based in the EU and they are allowed to sell these software technologies to these governments who they know are committing human rights abuses, they need to be held accountable. So, you know, at the end of the day, it all comes down to accountability. It comes down to accountability on the local level, and it comes down to accountability on the international level. And as long as there's no accountability on the international level, we will not see accountability on the local level. I think that there are several different things that can be done. First of all, raising awareness is very important. I mean, like we've already been discussing, nobody really hears much about Bahrain. But if you're on Twitter, you can get a minute-by-minute minute update of what's happening on the ground. All the protests, all the violations, all the attacks, all the arrests, all on Twitter. So it's not that, actually, there's so much overload of information coming out from Bahrain 
that people usually don't even know how to follow and who to follow and how to get all the information like in a way that is uh, you know not too much to handle or not too much to uh, be able to understand. Um, so there is one way is raising awareness, making sure that people around you know what's going on, sharing information, making sure your friends know about it. You know, all of that helps. The other thing is that yes, raising pressure on governments inside the EU and in the West makes a difference. The difference between our countries in the Middle East and the countries here is that you as a citizen matter. But here, if you can actually get people to tell the foreign minister that they don't like what he's doing, it might actually make a difference. Because your opinion matters as a citizen in a way that ours doesn't in my way. And that is how you can make a difference as well. You know, when you have, when you have Nasr bin Hamad, who's the king's son, who was involved in torturing political leaders in Bahrain, going to the Olympics as a VIP guest in London, one year after he committed those violations, what kind of message are we sending to the people of Bahrain? When the king himself and his wife and Nasr bin Hamad go to attend the Queen's Jubilee in the UK, after they have committed all of these violations, what message are we sending? This is a problem. You know, when the Queen of Denmark goes to Bahrain and meets with the king and gives him this honorary, um, what's it called? Yeah, it's like this royal honorary, whatever it is. I don't even know what it's called. Um, you know, and this was at a time when the there wasn't at the time of the uprising. It was right before the uprising started. It was in January 2011. But the fact that that was given to a monarch that is known for human rights violations, these things need to stop. We can't continue to give these kind of dictators or these kind of human rights violating regimes legitimacy. And by choosing to deal with them as if it's business as usual, that's exactly what we're doing. When we're willing to sell them arms, when we're willing to invite them to international events, we're giving them legitimacy. One of the ways to control, to talk about or to put a limit on human rights violations is by telling them, you know what? You want to commit human rights violations? We no longer are associated with you. But when every single time, you know, human rights violations happen, we come out in a statement and say, well, we're concerned. You know about what's happening in Bahrain, but they're our ally and friend. It's a problem because concern doesn't really cut it anymore. When a 14-year-old boy is being shot in the head and killed in Bahrain, for you know the foreign minister of the United Kingdom to say we're concerned, I'm sure that his concern is not going to make a difference for the mother of that child. It's not going to make any difference, especially now when half an hour later he's selling them arms, right? So there's, there's a lot that we can do. I think, you know, awareness raising, uh, putting pressure on, um, I mean, with Denmark, there's already, the pressure is there, but I think putting more pressure always helps to keep the issue in, in the light, in the interest of the foreign ministry. That always helps as well. Um, but then also, one of the things that's important is to always have very specific asks. Because going to the foreign ministry and being like, well, we want you to do something, but we're not quite sure what it is. You know, it's not really going to result in much. But when people keep, you know, calling the foreign ministry or calling the representatives of parliament and saying, well, this is what's happening, I know this is what's happening, I want to know what you're doing about it. I want to know what steps the ministry has taken or what steps you as a parliamentary person or a member have done specifically on this issue as my representative in government. What have you done about this? Suddenly, it matters, right? Because suddenly they have to answer questions. And when they have to answer questions, you better bet they're going to do something because they want to have answers. And so this kind of thing definitely helps because it keeps the issue at hand. One of the things, and I'll finish with this for other questions, one of the things that's very problematic is that the Bahraini regime has learned that if they can keep someone in prison for long enough, the international community forgets about them. You have to arrest someone, take all the slaps that you get, but don't do anything. And then after a month or two, people forget and you can keep that person in prison for life. Because that's how it is. You know, we'll fight for one month, for two months, but longer than that, people forget. And that's how they keep people in prison. Because even for people like the Danish citizens, how much are we really hearing about them anymore? They both, both my father and my sister were very close to dying a week ago. They were on, hunger, on dry hunger strike, which gives you about 72 hours before organ failure or coma. Who really was talking about it? Right? So 
basically keeping it out there, keeping it out there in the news, talking about it all the time, it makes a difference. So I think that's one of the things, and I think Amnesty in Denmark is doing a great job uh, in, in keeping it, you know, out there. Um, living in Bahrain, I mean, it's very easy that you can lose hope. Uh, you know, you, you feel so desperate, nothing is happening for the last two years, the, the number of people who have been killed already doubled. But then, there's only two ways uh, you can, you know, it's like you don't have other options, like there are two, two ways only. You either give up and you stay at home and you will die at home, and then nobody will hear, will hear your voice. And you lose your freedom and your dignity, and you're gonna lose um, most probably before you die. You will see your children dying in front of you, um, suffocating, and um, or uh, another or a brother of you go out in the street and then come back uh, dead body because the security forces shot him. And then the minister of foreign affairs come on Twitter saying that well he was shot because he was terrorized. And then uh, the security guard who shot him actually is a hero. So salute the hero. And uh, your brother needs to be buried as terrorist. So the other option is that you fight back. Now, uh, myself, being through all this, I know that I'm risking myself, risking my family, risking, uh, I, I might never be allowed to go back into the country. I might be arrested at the airport. Um, and guys, please, if I got arrested, start to tweet about me. So, um, I might not see my, my two kids at all uh, again. Um, my nationality might be revoked. So, you know, there are few, the, the people, it's either you fight back, you know when you feel like you're in a desperate situation, you either fight back or you stand there and die. And it's always a choice. Do you want to, st to stand there silently and die silently and nobody knows what's happening to you and you you're, you're let your children suffocate in their houses, uh, your brothers shut in the streets and die? Or you won't fight and then you might at the end die, you know I mean, like it happens, but then you will still die as a hero. You will die with your own dignity. You would know that whatever you've done is the right thing. You've been on the right track. Regardless of we win or not, I mean, standing there and fighting is winning. I mean, whenever I go out and talk, it's like, after all what happened to you, do you still feel like you're not hopeless? And I keep always and keep always smiling and say, for me, being the person that I'm, I'm right now, uh, compared to what I used to be as a selfish person who knows nothing about life and how the government is running and you know not thinking about what's happening actually from human rights violations just a, a street across me being the, the in position right now of knowing and trying to change and spreading the awareness of what's happening that's winning if I could convince one single person that what's happening in Bahrain it's not actually a sectarian problem. It's actually a, a problem between people, youth who came out in the street asking for basic rights, for democracy, for their freedom of expression, freedom of uh, of getting out into the streets, freedom of saying no, or freedom of ask for reforms and changes. If I could succeed in making this one single person outside my country get convinced that what's happening in Bahrain is for me and it's continuous, despite all the fact that they are being killed and shot every night, then that's a success. And that's why, as a human rights defender, as activists, as independent individual bodies, we try to make our voice reach out by tweeting, by going abroad and talking to people, to, uh, I mean, other activists, other NGOs, that make us, you know, survive and continue. That, that's resistance. And resistance, uh, resilience, will make the government at the end of the day give up. Um, I think, first of all, it's very difficult to put all the Middle East into one basket because they're, each country is very different than the other. Um, one of the things about Egypt that I think is always important to remember is that there was never really a real transformation. 
Uh, what happened is Egypt is you had the very tip of the pyramid fall off, but the entire structure was still there. After Mubarak left, it was the staff, the military that was running the show. So they never actually changed the regime. What they changed is the face of the regime. And so when the scaf handed it over, and the Muslim Brotherhood took over, you didn't actually have an entire regime change, even though you had voting in it. Like Muslim Brotherhood um, in Egypt sometimes reminds me of different uh, conservative groups that we have in Europe. You know, the fact that they are an Islamist group doesn't necessarily mean, even though they are doing very wrong things and not quite democratic, but we've seen the same kind of ideologies uh, evolve within political groups in Europe. Or, you know, who's not talking about the tea, bag, the tea Party in the United States, you know? So there are very political, religious groups that are, exist everywhere. Now, I, I believe in the idea of inclusion, not exclusion. When you exclude someone from the process, you make them more radical, you make them more extreme, and you actually give them more support. When you include them into the system, people can actually test them and see them for what, it, for what they are, and then decide if they actually want them or not. Now, why is it, why, when does it become problematic? It pro becomes problematic when that group is brought into power, and then they actually make changes within the system that gives them more power, and then they are able to stay for power much longer. Which is basically what Morsi did, right? He changed different things in the constitution that gave him more authority within the system. And the problem is that, not just with Morsi, the problem is, is that he created or granted this power for anyone else who's going to come after him. And that's where it's problematic. Um, I think that, you know, it's it's a process. I don't regret that the, that the uprisings in the Middle East and North Africa happened. I think they're necessary. It's going to take a long time for us to get to where we're going, but it's necessary. You know, I visited, um, I visited Tunisia and Egypt after the revolutions. And yes, the situation is really bad. Especially gender-based violence in Egypt is ridiculous. The fact that women are, and girls are getting raped in the middle of Tahrir Square now, two years after the revolution in Egypt, is outrageous. And the fact that you have political, uh, political people uh, or political officials in the country coming out and blaming the girls for the attack is even more outrageous. And it needs to immediately be stopped. But again, you know, the... The situation is really bad, and we have to do everything we can to try and resolve the issue, and to you know make sure that it's going in the right direction. But I don't regret that these uprisings happened. I visited Morocco a few months ago, and Morocco is one of the places where protests started, but they ended very quickly. And they still have protests from time to time, and I was there during the two-year anniversary of the February 20th movement. And I had the exact same feeling being in Morocco that I did in Bahrain in 2010 before the uprising. This feeling of fear, because you're constantly watched, because everything is so tightly controlled by the government. And, you know, I stood there for just five minutes and I said, thank God that we took to the streets of Bahrain. With everything that's happening in Bahrain and people being shot and living in the situation that we're living in, we are so much better off than where we were before the uprising. The, the violations are more, but we have regained our humanity, and we have regained our dignity. And no matter what the government does, they can't take that away from us again. Because we have decided to say no. Whereas in places like Morocco, you walk around, and you feel like this, there's this feeling of being broken. This feeling where you as a human being don't really exist, because you don't really matter within the context of the political, social, and culture, economical situation in the country. So I think you know it's a long, it's going to be a long process. It's going to take a lot of time for us to get there, and there's going to be a lot of tragic events that are going to happen. And you know, I, I spoke on a panel with someone from Nahma in Tunisia, uh, who you know was talking about how well they were doing and uh, how their you know progress is being made very fast. And I turned to him and I said, you know, one of the things that we're very disappointed about in Tunisia, which was supposed to be the role model for the you know the revolutions in the region. For us to now see protesters, peaceful protesters, being beaten up on the streets with a new government in power makes us ask questions about what's really going on, you know? So it's a process, and we have to keep fighting. The, the, re the way that we're going to see real change happen and real democracy achieved, or republic or whatever it is that people want, is through continuing what we started. We can't expect the change to happen after two years. And it's going to come with a very high price, and we knew this. 
And so we're going to have to live through that high price for as long as necessary until we get to where we're going. Any other questions? One of the things that we see across the region when it comes to sectarianism, or even the use of different religions, is the basic concept that you learn in politics. Divide and conquer. If you're able to divide the different groups in a country and make them fight each other, that's how you stay in power, right? Because if everyone's united against you, what are you gonna do? So you work actively within systematically creating a division between different groups in the country. And they don't only do this within countries, they even do this within the region. I'll give you an example. Saudi Arabia and Iran, right? So you have Iran, which supposedly is supposed to be the protector of all Shias in the region. And then you have Saudi Arabia, which supposedly is supposed to be the protector of all Sunnis in the region, right? That's how they like to present themselves to the world. But let's take a closer look at Iran and Saudi Arabia. The majority of political prisoners in Saudi Arabia are Sunni, not Shia. And the majority of political prisoners in Iran are Shia, not Sunni. So how are these really the protectors of these sects? What it comes down to is political influence, political gains. That's what they're interested in. That's what all of these governments are interested in. Now the question is, what happens when they actually succeed? We saw this in Syria. You know, Syria has been completely devastated in the past two years. How? Bashar al-Assad was very smart. He used the different sects against each other. He made it look like the entire attack on people inside Syria was coming from the Alawite sect. Although the Alawites themselves have a lot of people in prison who are tortured and who are killed. But he was able to make it look like it was the Alawite sect killing the Sunni sect. And this created animosity between the Alawites and the Sunnis, right? And so what is the, what's the language that's being used today that he's been successful in creating? And to some extent, this is actually happening. We're actually seeing different militia groups within Syria that not necessarily are focused on fighting Bashar al-Assad anymore. They're even fighting amongst themselves because he was able to create the split. Bahrain was not the same thing. Bahrain has been systematically separating through a system, separating between Sunnis and Shias in Bahrain. The Bahrainis never felt it before. You know, it was small stuff. For example, Shias are not allowed to work in the Ministry of Interior. For example, Shias are not allowed to work in the Youth and Sports Department. They're not allowed to work in the military, right? But nobody really paid attention to this. Everyone knew it was happening, but nobody was really paying attention to it. As a Shia, the Shia are majority in Bahrain. As a Shia, you go to school in Bahrain, from first grade to university, you take a mandatory religion class, and you are taught that you, as a Shia, you're not a real Muslim and that you're going to, uh, to hell, and you have to write this on the exam. And I've, I've actually experienced this myself in Bahrain. And I've seen how they teach these religion classes in the country. But again, people didn't really pay attention to this. There was never a social fabric problem between the Sunnis and Shias in Bahrain. They intermarry. You know, we, we used to make a joke about this and call families that were mixed Shia and Sunni, we call them sushi. You know, that's, that person is a sushi because his father is Sunni and their mother is Shia. There was a lot of intermarriage. My best friends, you know, and different best friends in, in Bahrain were Sunnis and Shias. It was never an issue until the, uh, the crackdown started. What happened was the crackdown was done in a very sectarian way in Bahrain for two reasons, right? What they did is they created an entire situation where if you're Shia, it doesn't matter if you're a professor, if you're a doctor, if you're a farmer, it doesn't matter. If you're Shia, you're targeted, right? They demolished around 35 mosques that belong to the Shia sect. This hasn't happened anywhere else, by the way. Right? Some of these mosques are so historically important to the Shia sect of the country that they rerouted highways so that they wouldn't have to do anything to these mosques. They were demolished within 24 hours. And so there was this immense widespread attack on one sect. Why? It wasn't because everyone in that sect is not loyal to the, the ruling family. There are many Shias who are. And it wasn't because all of the Shias and only the Shias were uh, participating in the protest. I actually feel offended when people say that. Because dignity and human rights are something that I support for everyone. I won't allow someone to tell me that, oh, those Bahraini Sunnis don't care about their dignity and human rights. That's insulting. 
everyone cares about their dignity and their rights. And that's why everyone was in the false square, whether they were from or Shia. But what they did is they created a situation where they created this, uh, a scenario where you were targeted at based on your sex. And when they arrested someone, all of the insults were according to religious beliefs. Not only just as, you know, regular people. So, why, why did they do this? Two reasons. One, making it look like it was a Shia uprising and not a Bahraini uprising makes it easier to link it to Iran as well. Now, of course, if they're able to do that, it's very easy to, to, for the you know international community to then say, well, Iran, since Iran is involved, we can't do anything about this, you know, because Iran is the big boogeyman in the area. And so, of course, since Iran is backing the protesters in Bahrain, there's nothing the international community can do, right? So it was used as an excuse for them to do absolutely nothing about the situation in Bahrain. Although, if you look at the documentary that Al Jazeera did, you will see people in the cross square, in Bahrain, in the protest, being asked if they want to see Iran to interfere or Iran support the protest, and they said, we don't want to move from one dictatorship to another. This was people in the protest saying this. And yet, they were all accused of being Iranian agents and Iranian spies, right? And so they created a scenario where it was easier to link them to Iran and Hezbollah. And then they also, the second reason why they did this was because they wanted to create a situation where they send a message to the Sunnis in the country that our problem is not you. Step aside, be quiet, we won't target you. You're not the issue. The issue is with these people. You want to continue working? You want to continue having a salary? You don't want your children to be killed? Don't get involved. Because our problem is not with you. But at the end of the day, what is it really about? What is, what is the target of this regime at Bahrain? It's about loyalty. And that's why Ibrahim Sharif, who's a liberal Sunni in Bahrain, is today serving a five-year prison sentence that was passed by a military court, and he was tortured in prison. And Samir al who's from a Shia family, is today the Minister of Information and one of the worst spokespeople for the Bahraini government. Because at the end of the day, it's really about whether you're loyal or not. Right? And whether you serve the interests or not. Now, the way that they're smart is that they created this entire scenario, and then they came out and said, well, as a ruling family in Bahrain, actually, we're very, uh, we're very sad to see the situation develop between the two groups in the country. And we want to do reconciliation. You know, let's bring the Sunnis and Shias to talk to each other because they have a problem, and us as a ruling family, let's resolve it for them because they need to solve their issues. So it was no longer about the ruling family or a political problem or a human rights problem. It was suddenly about two sects fighting each other in the country. This is what they want. Now, has this been successful? To some extent, it has. It's become very polarized. Yes. Because you were at a point in Bahrain, you have the Sunni and the Shia accents. As soon as you open your mouth and you speak, people know whether you're Sunni or Shia. They know it from your name. When you're stopped at a checkpoint, the minute you give them the, your card and it has your name on it, they know if you're Sunni or Shia. It depends on where you live. Because like I said, this is not something that started two years ago. This is that something that they've been working on for 15, 20 years. Because they wanted to make sure that if something like this ever happened in Bahrain, they could divide and conquer like that. And that's what they did. And so even residential areas in Bahrain are split up according to whether you're Sunni or Shia. There are areas where, where Shias are not allowed to live in the country. You can't rent, you can't buy. Because you're Shia. There's a quasi-apartheid system in Bahrain. Just like the way it was in South Africa, not exactly the same, but to some extent. Where they separate between Sunnis and Shias systematically to create a separation. And so yes, they have been successful to some extent in polarizing. Because if, if I was Sunni in Bahrain and I saw that you know I have a very good paying job and my family's safe, we're not living in an area where we're being terrorized every single night, why would I go out and put myself, my family, my relatives, all at risk just to say something, or just to participate in a protest, which I don't even know is going to actually result in anything. So they have to some extent been able to polarize the situation. There are still Sunnis that go out in the protest, but they're very quiet. Because when a Sunni participates in a protest, they might be targeted even more than the Shia. Because they represent a threat. Just like when the Alawites in Syria, according to one of the cases that I heard, the Alawites in Syria tried to sneak in food, 
to one of the Sunni areas that was besieged by the regime, and they were all arrested because they tried to kill us. What these governments, what these regimes don't want is people united and people sticking together. It doesn't serve their interests. And so the best thing we can do as people of that region is for us to unite. It's for us to refuse sectarianism, it's for us to refuse these situations that they're trying to create that actually serves their purpose. It's difficult, but we have to keep trying. Think of it this way. You have a country of 600,000 people where almost the entire military and security forces in the country are non Bahraini. Right? For the past 10, 15 years, the Bahraini regime has been politically naturalizing tens of thousands of people from outside of Bahrain and putting them in the military and the security forces. From Pakistan, from Jordan, from Yemen, from uh, Syria, from, uh, we've heard claims that there are some from Morocco and some from Iraq. They do this for two reasons. One, because they don't, because Shias who are the majority of the country are not allowed in the military and the security forces and so they need to bring people from abroad. And two, because every single person that they politically nationalize is Sunni. And so they're trying to change the demographics of the country from being a Shia majority into a Sunni majority. And they've been doing this for a very long time. But not only the Shia suffer from the political nationalization, the Sunnis do too. There are Sunnis also living in poverty in Bahrain. There are Sunnis also waiting for government houses that's going to new people that are coming to work in the military forces. And so everyone in Bahrain is suffering from this aspect of the situation. But Imagine that Bahrain, you know, there's this common joke in Bahrain that everyone says, and it's less of a joke <laughs> because it's not really funny, but um, they always say in Bahrain, the Bahrain is the only country where you get beaten on the streets by a Yemeni, you get arrested by a, by a Pakistani, you get interrogated by a Jordanian, you get tortured by a Syrian, and then the judge that passes the verdict on you is an Egyptian. And the only person in this entire mess that's Bahraini is the protester. That's the current situation in Bahrain, right? So the fact that they've been able to build up this force for them, uh, for themselves as the ruling family, it, it's protected them so far. Because you don't have Bahraini standing there being like, well, I can't shoot these people because they're my family members, you know? Which to some extent happened in Egypt and in other places. Or you don't have defections. Because these people don't have any loyalty or connections to the people of the country. And so for them, it's a lot more important to be able to keep feeding their families, which they brought from their countries with them to Bahrain, than for them to, to you know, stand there and be like, well, I can't choose that person because they're related to me or because we have this connection from being from the same group. So that's a big problem. The second thing is that, you know, when you have 20, 30,000 protesters standing there screaming, Silmiya, Silmiya, which means peaceful, peaceful, and the riot police standing in front of them are all Pakistani who don't speak Arabic, all they see is a bunch of protesters screaming at them. What's their reaction? They don't actually know that what they're saying means peaceful. While the protesters are actually trying to send them a message that we're not here to attack you. We don't have a problem with you. So that's one of the main reasons that they, that they haven't been able to create or knock down any of these pillars that you're talking about. But I think the main reason is what I mentioned earlier. Accountability and international support. The fact that the Bahraini regime continues to receive weapons, the fact that we have the fifth fleet that belongs to the US in Bahrain, the fact that we have the air base that belongs to the United Kingdom in Bahrain, Bahrain is like an island that's this big, and yet we have all these foreign bases that's based in our country, right? Because of this, the people in Bahrain, I mean, think about it. How are 300, 400,000 people, a lot of them youth, going to fight not only the Bahraini regime, but the Bahraini regime, Saudi regime, whose forces, by the way, are still in Bahrain today, as well as the UAE regime, and Qatar, and Kuwait, and to add to that, the support that they're getting from the United States and the United Kingdom. When the Bahraini people took to the streets, they knew that they weren't fighting one regime. They're fighting the entire GCC. They're fighting six different regimes that exist in this region. And to add to that, the support that's coming from the United States and the United Kingdom. So, it's, you know, they're in it for the long haul. But what I love about the Bahrainis, you know, and I visited a lot, I went back for the first time to Bahrain last January, and I was lucky enough not to get arrested, but I went around a lot and met with people inside the different villages, and the one sentence that I kept hearing everywhere I went is Sumut, which means steadfast, which means perseverance, but also the sentence, no government can outlast its people. If the people decide they want change, 
it's a matter of time. It's only a matter of time, nothing else. Because there's no government that can stay around forever if the people decide that it has to go. No matter how much support they have, no matter how powerful they are. The situation changes, and the situation is going to change. And people are going to become more radicalized because they feel like they've been internationally abandoned and because they feel like they have absolutely no support in Right? Um, but it doesn't mean that they're going to stop trying. I think, you know, I, I know that a lot of the talks that happen about Bahrain are usually very depressing. Uh, and they're usually not very optimistic. Uh, so I want to try with a very short story. Uh, they usually, you know, raises optimism for me or gives me hope. And it happened about two years ago, uh, after my father got arrested. When my father was arrested, he was beaten until he was unconscious in front of my family. And he was taken away, and when he was taken away, my family members didn't know if he was alive or dead. Um, and so it was a very bad situation, and after that, he was severely tortured. He was one of the worst torture cases in Bahrain uh, in 2011. And they went to visit him in prison. And, you know, they were very depressed. The situation in Bahrain was really bad. There was a crackdown. The GCC forces or the army were in Bahrain. People were getting beaten and shot left and right. And basically, it was a very, very depressing situation where people were starting to lose hope. And so my family sat with my father, and, you know, they were all very depressed. And my father turned to them and said, why are you depressed? What's going on? And they said, well, you know, we're not receiving any international support. Nobody really cares about us. And people are being shot and killed on the streets. What's there not to be depressed about? And my father told them, your attitude is wrong. Because the victory of all these situations that we're in isn't regime change. The victory isn't democracy. The victory isn't actually seeing the situation in the country change. The initial victory of all of these revolutions is that people went out on the streets. That's the victory. That people, that, that people decided, you know, everyone says that fear was lost in these countries. People are no longer afraid. That's not true. Fear exists as long as the consequences are real. When you know that you can get tortured, arrested, you can get beaten, your family might get targeted, that you can be killed, the fear is there. It's the fact that you find something that is worth getting killed for. It's the fact that you find something where you are willing to go out on the streets and face the guns despite the fear, despite the consequences. That was the victory. And that should be celebrated. And that's what my father told them. He told them every single day you should celebrate the fact that we've had that initial victory. What comes next is something we need to work for. But that's secondary. And sometimes just continuing to be happy, continuing to live your life, refusing to give in, refusing to be depressed, in itself is a form of resistance. In itself is a form of you know, nonviolent protest because you're refusing to give up. And that makes all of the difference. You know, one of the things that a lot of people were telling me, they were like, weren't you worried that your father was going to die in his hunger strike? And I said, and they were like, why, is, why does he want to die? Why does he want to die? And I kept saying, he's willing to die to live. He doesn't want to die. What he's doing is he's risking his life because he wants to live, because he loves life. And he's not willing to spend it within four walls. And that's what I think is the message that we need to spread. Is that people are not going out because they want to die. They're going out because they want to live. And because they have decided they felt something more important than the fear that they possess. So I think I'll end with that. Thank you all for coming today.